Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, my name is Kelly Larson and I'm the Chicken Wrangler. Chicken wrangling at its finest. Turkeys are pretty easy to herd, but chickens are another story. It's like herding cats. These are a small breed of turkey called Royal Palm, and they are a heritage breed that was developed, I believe, in Florida. And they were developed as an ornamental breed mainly. Do you see the, uh, the, the uh, fleshy part that hangs <laughs> over their bill? Mm -hmm. Watch how that, gr see how long it got? Mm -hmm. Now you watch that, That's a, it's called a snoot. There, now it's gotten small. Mm -hmm. Depending upon their uh, emotional state, it will elongate or contract. <laughs> He's pretty excited right now, wouldn't you should say? <laughs> and the colors also, uh, the red in the wattles and uh, in the neck area and the blue on the cheeks is very vibrant when they're agitated or when they're displaying or when they're being aggressive towards each other. When they're calm, all that color kind of drains out and it's just a pale pink. They test each other. Um, it's better if you have a flock of males that have grown up together. They're much more tolerant of each other. If you have a new adult male that you're going to introduce into a flock, it can take some time. Housing them separately within view of each other is a good idea. There we had a little bit of a fight going on. Uh, there is always going to be some fighting. It is in the nature of, of poultry to work out the pecking order. Who's going to, who's going to be on top? Once that's worked out though, uh, it pretty much, unless there's uh, some major issue where somebody gets sick or injured, it's a fairly stable environment. Um, so we haven't had a whole lot of fighting here. But I like working with them because they're not so big that when you put a turkey dinner on the table, you're eating turkey for two weeks. A smaller bird is a little uh, more manageable for a small family. They uh, tend to have a little smaller carriage, but they're a much more active turkey. They fly well, they know how to roost, they're excellent foragers, and they're wonderful parents. Contrary to popular belief, heritage turkeys are wonderful parents. And I have heard so many people tell me that turkeys are stupid and they're uh, terrible mothers and you cannot raise turkey poults with a, a natural hatch. I have hens that go broody at the drop of a hat and get dewy-eyed when they see a golf ball. And uh, I've got a couple of hens in there right now with turkey poults and if you get near them, they will probably take your head off. Now, I'm gonna walk over there and we're gonna see how defensive these uh, hens get. So if anybody tells you that turkeys are bad moms, oh now you're being, you guys are being chicken. I, I guess that I guess I am no longer a threat. But yeah, several days ago, um, especially when the eggs were still hatching and they were still on the nest, they would fly off the nest at me and uh, beat with their wings, fly up and try to claw you. They're still pretty worried though. This is hen number three in the, in the batch of three tur uh, turkey hens that uh, decided to go broody about a month and a half ago. I haven't given her any hatching eggs yet, but she's going to get very upset. Oh, look at you. You got five eggs. I think we're gonna let you have those. Yeah, we'll let you have those. She's also molting. You see how uh, ratty her tail feathers look right now. She's, she's ready to molt that tail out. Right now I'm feeling her breast uh, just to see her general condition. She's been sitting in here for a month, and a month, month and a half, and they can lose a lot of body weight. Um, I just want to make sure she has, has enough meat on her to uh, go another 28 days till these eggs are hatched, and she seems fine. When they do go broody, they'll stay on that nest 
um, all day, getting off maybe twice, maybe three times a day for 15 or 20 minutes uh, at a time, grab a quick bite to eat, have a drink, uh, do your business, get back on the nest, because if you let those eggs set for any longer than 20 or 30 minutes, they get chilled and viability goes down, the hatch is bad. Normally towards the end of the hatching season, and we're talking right about now, I, I'm not really doing a lot of incubating right now, uh, I will let those hens keep a clutch of eggs. Uh, it's good practice for them, and it also allows me to, to see which of the hens that I have uh, on the property have the right instincts to be good setters, to be good mothers, to forage well. Uh, and then I can make decisions in the fall. Maybe this was not a really good bird to keep because it doesn't have the instincts, so we're not going to breed her next year. Wonderful place for a turkey to roost. Even though that all of the heritage breeds that I'm working with are capable of brooding and hatching their own eggs and raising their own young, is that I keep collecting those eggs so that I, they continue to lay so that I can hatch them in the incubator. Because if I let them sit on all of those eggs right away, they'll stop laying once they've laid eight to 10, 12 eggs, and they're gonna shut down egg production for at least a couple of months. 21 days for the chickens to hatch those eggs, and another month having those chicks follow the hen around before she starts laying again. And that's a lot of downtime when you're trying to increase the numbers of a uh, rare breed. So we keep collecting the eggs, uh, storing them, setting them in the incubator. With incubation, you need to keep the eggs moving. If the eggs were just to stay still, and there are still incubators, the uh, yolk will settle in one position and will actually adhere to the membrane and get stuck to the inside of the shell. And then the embryo doesn't form properly and uh, hatching is very difficult. So the hen is always fidgeting around in her nest, and so this just simulates that. I think there's six peacock eggs in here. I need to hatch another round of Americanas for a friend, too. And as you can see, there's quite a difference in the size of a peacock egg compared to a good-sized chicken egg. The chicken eggs will take 21 days to hatch, and the peacock eggs, the turkey eggs, will take uh, 28 days and they need to stay in here uh, for that whole time. Uh, for, at four days before the hatch is due, we stop the turning process. So then they'll go into a hatching tray where they actually stay still. That way the uh, young birds inside the eggs can orientate themselves to up and start pecking their way out. Yes, Nora's quite excited to have some new chicks in the house. After they hatch in the incubator, they go into a brooding area. And for my purposes, uh, I'll use a stock tank in the house with a heat lamp over it. And the young chicks need to be kept at about 95 degrees for the first week, which is quite warm and no drafts. Uh, so they'll stay in here for the first week to two, uh, to two weeks, depending upon how many birds I have at one time. And then they'll go to a new brooding area that has more space. These guys are about a week old now, just, just coming on a week old. And there's about 100 chicks in here, if you can believe it. Trying to keep up with keeping them clean and the water clean and the food uh, with this many birds can really be a challenge. Another thing I do with these birds at least every couple of days is check each one to make sure that their butts are clean. This is butt check time. If they were to get compacted with diarrhea and they start to crust over, they can actually uh, close the whole thing up and they'll die within a matter of days. So we do periodic buck checks and make sure that everybody's good and healthy. After a week, you can turn the uh, temperatures down by five degrees a week and they should be fine. And there's about four breeds in here right now. I've got uh, Chanticleers in here and Dominiques, Americanas, and Spitzhabens, my favorite. This tank is a little small to be handling this many birds, so I'm anxious to get them into their larger quarters today. But so far, everybody looking really good. Most people start their chicks on commercial chick starter ration. Most of the rations, commercial rations that are available have um, antibiotics in them and I don't like to use any additives to my feed, so I use a game bird feed, which they, they don't put any antibiotics in the game bird feed. So it's 22% protein. 
And I pretty much keep them on that uh, for their entire life. They seem to grow really well on it. But I do put apple cider vinegar in the water and electrolytes for the first couple of weeks, and that helps uh, with early chick diseases like coccidiosis until they build up their own their immunities. This is a good, healthy batch of chicks. Nora thinks they look like a tasty batch of chicks. <laughs> Nora, my little dumpster girl. This is the Nora the dumpster diva. Why anybody would throw a kitten in the dumpster and walk away, I don't know. All of my cats have been rescues. And they're mostly indoor cats. They get some outside time, but usually it's chaperoned. Hey, babies. I'm going to guess that these guys are probably five weeks old, and they will be ready to go out on pasture in another, probably another week. Especially early in the season, you have to wait long enough to get the birds out until they're fully feathered because a young bird just uh, cannot uh, uh, regulate its own body temperature until it has those hard outer feathers. Fluff is uh, fine for the few first uh, couple of weeks, uh, underneath the hen, but it, it's no protection against the elements. Don't you want to take them home? We've got partridge chanticleers in there and a few blue Americanas and the Swiss Appenzeller Spitzhabens. There are a few Dominiques in there as well. They kind of go through phases where the first week or two they're, they're pretty uh, docile, and then they go through a really flighty stage, and then they get a little more confidence, and they settle down a little more. And, and I, I don't handle these birds on a daily basis. You know, they're not all picked up and coddled. And I talk to them when I come in, and I walk in and out of the, uh, the cage area slowly so they're used to somebody moving through. Because we can't make pets out of all of our food as cute as they are and curious. These are smart chickens. And if I didn't have so much other work to do, I would be bringing you fresh greens every day. That's something that people that, that have a small flock uh, can do for their young birds is bring them grass clippings, bring them the weeds out of the garden that you pull. Oh, and we're practicing our roosting skills. So you can get, the, for example, these chanticleers, the buff and the partridge chanticleer in here, come in large, what they call large fowl and bantam. So it's like uh, full size and miniature, just like with poodles, standard and miniature and toy. So that's what the bantams are. And there's a few breeds that only have, I think it's seabrights are the only ones that don't have a large fowl counterpart. I think it's really important that people consider keeping backyard flocks again. I mean, there had been a day when practically everybody had at least a little laying flock in the backyard and um, meat birds for their Sunday dinner, especially in the fall when the chicks were, were grown and ready to cull down for your pullets and laying flock. Uh, being dependent upon our industrial farming systems uh, just isn't an option anymore. Uh, I think. The further down that road we've come, uh, the uh, more clear it's become that it, it's not the way to do things. Uh, not knowing where our food has come from, being dependent upon fertilizers and petrochemical uh, additives to keep our crops growing and to feed our livestock. Uh, and knowing how these animals are treated, their living conditions and the processing uh, conditions uh, not acceptable for me, anyway. I'd, I'd much rather uh, process my own meat than buy it, buy it in a store and know that it had a good, healthy, happy life. If people don't start keeping these breeds in their backyards again, um, working with them and, and, and using them and using them for their, their table eggs and, and their, and their um, uh, meat pr to go in their freezers, we're going to lose all of these beautiful breeds that have taken thousands of years to develop. Uh, 
and are, you know, so perfectly suited to specific climates. What's going to happen if industrial farming practices collapse and we don't have, uh, we can't rely on, uh, on a commercial industrial poultry industry anymore? Something wipes out those flocks. Uh, we need to keep this genetic diversity uh, as, as, a, as an insurance policy and as a bank. And if more people don't start working with it, we won't have those breeds to fall back on. All of the turkey that we buy in the grocery store for the most part are industrial turkeys, uh, broad-breasted white and broad-breasted bronze to a lesser extent. And they have pretty much bred out the tendency for the hens to go broody. The toms are no longer able to do what comes naturally because they're just too big in the breast to balance on the hens. So all that's done artificially, so it's not much of a life for a turkey. And so they really don't have uh, the instincts to take care of their young, to set eggs, to care for themselves or their young out in a natural environment, uh, which is is a pretty sad state of affairs. Uh, I can breed these birds naturally, unlike the industrial broad-breasted uh, turkeys that we normally get in the grocery store. The broad-breasted white and the broad-breasted bronze, pretty much their um, brooding and uh, natural foraging uh, abilities have been bred out of them. They no longer know how to be good mothers. Uh, unlike the heritage breeds. So working with these older breeds, you can propagate your own uh, turkeys for next year's use and keep them going and, and they can raise their own chicks. And that's always a plus too. Rufus, come here. I don't have a lot of birds with names, but this, this rooster, I did not hand rear this rooster. He just grew up in a large hatch and He's, it turned out to be very docile and easygoing, and he doesn't like it when I c come to pick him up, but once I have him in my arms, he's very relaxed. And he's been to school to talk to the kids, and he's been to, well, he was, this is, this is a bird that was at the Indigenous Farming Conference, and this is the... Chanticleer, the buff variety Chanticleer, Canadian breed. And these are, these are not actually his babies. Now, this is how docile every rooster ought to be. He's just a lovely bird. He's got good body weight uh, for his breed. He's got a nice uh, full carriage. He's heavily feathered. Um, the breed standard would say that this, this individual is a little too heavily feathered, but with our cold temperatures here in Minnesota and the Dakotas, I, this is an advantage to me. Uh, a breeder who was showing this breed at a fair or at a poultry show would probably not choose to breed this bird because he's a little too fluffy. I'm trying to breed my birds towards the utilitarian um, features of the, of the breed rather than just another pretty face. Uh, there are a lot of hobbyists out there that do the poultry tours and it's, it's kind of like the dog shows, but it's not always um, what's uh, in the best interest of the breed as a whole and not necessarily um, choosing good utility. So he's got good utility. Nice warm bird, good heavy carriage. He makes a good dinner. He's not going to be, this one won't be dinner though. Well, if you're interested in working with some of the heritage birds, those birds that are critically endangered uh, of becoming lost, you may want to check out the uh, website of the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. Uh, they're a really good resource for the different breeds that are available and also they have a link to a breeder's uh, directory where you can uh, uh, access hatching eggs or chicks sent, th sent through the mail or actually meet some of these people that are working with heritage breeds like myself. Uh, I do sell chicks uh, from the farm here. I, I don't mail chicks but I often will drive as far uh, from Bagley as Ely or Grand Marais to deliver uh, a, a group of heritage birds to a person who really wants to work with the breed. Uh, so that's always a possibility, so, so people could contact me. 
Uh, if you're really interested in working with good stock that uh, is good for utility, that's going to produce good meat and good eggs for you, and you want to work with one of those breeds, I would look at a, a private breeder or a place like Sandhill uh, Preservation, which works with critically endangered species, rather than the larger catalog mail order companies. There's a lot of big hatcheries out there, and they have a lot of birds available. A great variety. Sometimes it's not a bad idea just to start with a few, a small flock of maybe two of these and three of those and four of those just to find out which breed works really good for you. But then find a reputable breeder who's specifically working with that breed and get your, your uh, starter stock from them. Come on out. Well, these chickens are smarter than we are. They want to stay in the shade. It is very important that you take a look at the, the space and your setup, uh, how you're going to house these birds, how you're going to deal with them in the wintertime. When you have poultry, it is very difficult to go anywhere for any length of time. Uh, I, have a, I have a difficult time leaving the farm for two or three days unless you have neighbors who are willing to come in and take, your, take care of your birds. They need care every day. It's not like a horse or a cattle or goats that you could throw a couple of big bales of hay out there and have a stock tank going and leave them for a week. Poultry just takes to, uh, a lot more attention than that. Um, so have, have a backup plan. Have somebody in mind that can take care of your poultry if you need to go somewhere. And if that's not, if you travel a lot, uh, I, would, I would have second thoughts about getting, getting uh, backyard poultry. Yeah. But if somebody wanted to contact me and had questions, I, I would be happy to talk to them about heritage poultry and where to get started and, and, and the resources available. And they could email me at northernflightsfarm at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. If you have segment ideas pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund by the vote of the people on November 4, 2008.